Assalamualaikum and good evening. Viewers, it is widely believed that all the international agencies and factors leave no stone unturned in order to put Pakistan in complete disarray. The internal turmoil infested with terrorism, many believe sponsored from outside, has crippled the country completely and is on the verge of a collapse. It may look like a mission accomplished especially for India but Pakistan it seems has the strength resilience and an unbreakable faith to come out of this rut and designed mess up situation Viewers, the question over here is that why aren't our government officials focusing on some aspects right now let us have some, let us have an example of Mumbai attacks first when Taj hotel was attacked Indian officials without any proof they blamed Pakistan for for the mess and defame our country internationally. What comes out of it as reported by Times of India July 14, 2013 is the former Indian Home Ministry officer and investigator Satish Verma disclosed that incumbent government orchestrated and pre-planned this terror attack on its own parliament and carnage in Mumbai in 2008 as well, creating terror, chaos and and killing hundreds of innocent people in cold blood. Secondly, what do you think after the statement of Indian Army Chief General retired, V.K. Singh, our friendly neighbor, is trying to do with us? Indian Army paid ministers for destabilizing the government in Kashmir. Then the LOC issue, and now the attack on Magbuza Kashmir. Without any solid proof, our friendly neighbor has once again blamed Pakistan for this attack. What we don't understand is that why are we so keen about having Aman Ki Asha, having good relations with a country which always misuse and defame our country for their own benefits? What exactly should we have to change in Pak India foreign policy? What exactly India wants? And what should be Pakistan's political behavior towards them? For all that aspects, we would like to know. I have Mr. Zaid Hamid with me joining in this discussion. Assalamu alaikum Zaid Hamid Saab and thank you for joining us. As you can tell that we would like to know today about the relations between Pakistan and India, the two neighbors that, you know, we are standing today at this stage. But first, before we start our discussion, we have put together a report telling since 1980s that what ups and downs both the countries are having, the on and off relationship they are going through. Let's have a look at that and then we will start our discussion. Ups and downs of India and Pakistan relations. There have been numerous attempts to improve the relationship between Pakistan and India. Since the early 1980s relation between the two nations soared particularly after the Siachen conflict. The intensification of Kashmir insurgency in 1989, Indian and Pakistani nuclear tests in 1989 and 1999 Kargil war. To restart dialogue between the two nations were given a major boost by February 1999 meeting of both Prime Ministers in Lahore and three signing agreements. In 2001, Pakistani Army Chief General Pervez Musharraf visited India. General Pervez Musharraf and Indian Prime Minister Atal Bihari Vajpayee had dialogue in Agra. 2001, Indian Parliament attack almost brought the two nations on the brink of a nuclear war. In 2003, Prime Minister Atal Bihari Vajpayee extended the hand of friendship towards Pakistan and two countries signed ceasefire agreement on line of control. After that, Delhi Lahore bus service has been started. That was a successful effort in de-escalating tension. In 2004, the comprehensive peace talks began between Pakistan and India. In 2007, Sanjota Express bombing was also a crucial point in relations. Approximately one and a half years after, the Indian authorities revealed that explosive material was provided by Colonel 
battle of an Indian army. At this release, the 2008 Mumbai attacks resulted in a severe blow to ongoing India-Pakistan peace talks. On 10 February 2011, India agreed to resume talks with Pakistan, which were suspended after 26-11 Mumbai attacks. India had put on board all the diplomatic relations, saying it will only continue if Pakistan will act against the accused of Mumbai attacks. On 13 April 2012, following a tour in relations whereby Indian gained MFN status, the most favored nation status in the country. India announced the removal of restrictions on FDI investment from Pakistan to India. Now in 2013, 120 incidents of ceasefire violation have occurred so far along line of control in Jammu and Kashmir, highest in the last eight years. Yes, Zahid Ahmed Sahib, as you saw the report on on and off relationship between Pakistan and India, I would like to know first, historically, if we go back and we analyze the history, we have Qaeda Azam's saying uh, on 20th October 1947 in his speech, he warned us that India are going to attack the two-nation theory. He said they are going to attack the two-nation theory. Two-nation theory must be guarded. Now, he's warning us in 1947, and then we see in 1971, one, um, Gandhi in her speech in the Gandhi mentions that we have taken the revenge for a thousand years slavery and the second thing that she mentioned is that today we have drowned the two nation theory so the warning from Qaeda Azam getting proved almost after 25 years by Indra Gandhi how do you see that you see Pakistan India relationships are a complex issue which the world does not understand the world tried to resolve the disputes between Pakistan and India on the basis of trade relations, on the basis of more economic activity or diplomatic contacts. But this is, the time has come now that we understand the baggage of history. Ever since the creation of Pakistan, since 1947, both countries, India and Pakistan, are in a perpetual state of war with only in intermittent periods of ceasefire. There has never been peace. There have been ceasefires. And the, both the countries have always remained in a state of war. Immediately, while, while Pakistan was being created, one of the greatest slaughter of human history took place while Pakistan was being made. Almost 5 million people were butchered on their way towards Pakistan in India by Hindus and radical Hindus and radical Sikhs to people who were migrating towards Pakistan when the British India was divided into Pakistan and India in 1947. So the blood started from the very beginning. The blood feud was actually triggered at the very beginning even before the birth of the two nations. After the creation of Pakistan, 1948 war over Kashmir, India occupied Kashmir, a war which lasted almost 14 months. Even immediately after the birth of two nations, the war was triggered in Kashmir and the right. Kashmir dispute still remains a flashpoint for a nuclear war. After 65 years, Kashmir is, remains an unde undecided, disputed land. So, so, so we have been through so many wars between the two countries and uh, we see an ill intention from India. So how do you see that we will be progressing towards any positivity then? You see, coming back to your point first, I would like to explain, to explain that in historical context. In 1971, we fought a war with India after 1948. Another high intensity conflict was fought in 1965 again over Kashmir. In 1971, India was able to dismember Pakistan's eastern wing. East Pakistan was dismembered and now, which is Bangladesh, was created. Right. After the creation of Bangladesh, Indira Gandhi celebrated a victory speech in the, in the Indian parliament. And there, which the speech that you quoted, she mentioned two points. She said, today we have taken the revenge of 1,000 years of Muslim rule and slavery. slavery and right. second she said that we have drowned the two nation theory in the Bay of Bengal. Now these are the most profound statements coming from an Indian leader, mainstream Indian leader, Indira Gandhi, whose party rules India today. Unless you understand the context of these two statements, you will never understand why Pakistan and India remain at war perpetually. Fact of the matter is, 
that India carries a burden of shame and humiliation upon its conscience. Every Hindu living in India, every political leader carries a burden of shame and humiliation for the simple fact that Muslims ruled over India for a thousand years. A handful of Muslims came from Central Asia, Afghanistan, Iran, Turkey, Arab lands and they ruled India dynasty after dynasty after dynasty. One thousand years of Muslim rule and Indians are at a loss to explain this. So they want Pakistan to pay back another thousand years? So, let, me, let me finish. Indians are at a loss to explain this. How did this happen that handful of Muslims ruled over India for a thousand years and the sense of revenge is burning, is burning rage within always, perpetually. No Hindu ever forgets this. Even outside world doesn't know this but the venom came out when the Indira Gandhi made that speech in the parliament after she defeated Pakistan in East Pakistan and created Bangladesh, dismembered Pakistan. The happiness of achieving an, achieving a victory it against in her Muslims speech in came out and she said today we have taken the revenge of a thousand year slavery. So this baggage of slavery never leaves Indian psyche, Indian mindset. And the fact of the matter is it's not just the baggage of a thousand years behind, it's also the fear the same thing can happen again in future. They suffer from a perpetual inferiority complex. They live in a perpetual fear of a Muslim invasion from the West. Always, you pick up the history. For the last 1500 years, ever, 1400 years, ever since the Islam has come into this region, ever since Islam came into this world, Muslims have been attacking India from the West, from Afghanistan, from Central Asia, from Iran, from, from Turkey, from Arab lands, as we said. So this perpetual fear, the mountains in Afghanistan are called Hindu Kush, which literally means the Hindu killers. Because every time Hindus went in that region to protect India, they were slaughtered and butchered by the invading Muslim forces from the West. So creation of Pakistan, again, See, after 1000 years, Hindus could not dislodge Muslims. Muslims were dislodged by the British. So this is an important point to understand. Right. right. And when the British were leaving, British ruled India for about 90 years, and the British were leaving, for the first time in almost 1500 years, Hindus thought they could have a unified, united India at their disposal. They will rule again. But the brilliant Muslim leadership of the time, given with the vision given by Dr. Alama Iqbal and the political leader of Dr. Azam Muhammad Ali Jinnah, they, f they created an impossible political, created an impossible political miracle if you call it, created Pakistan. India was divided, in, the continent was divided into two sovereign countries, India and Pakistan. And the creation of Pakistan was done on the basis of a theory called the two nation theory which says Hindus and Muslims are two nations who cannot live together and must have their separate homeland once the British leave. They are two different identities. They are two different identities, two different people, two different nations which are antagonistic to each other and cannot coexist. This is two nation theory. And on the basis of that, Pakistan was created on the western side, on the northwestern side of the United Indian subcontinent. And that is the region. Pakistan, that area where Pakistan is situated today, is the area from where all the invaders have been coming and attacking India towards Delhi, towards the central India, the mainland. So, when Indira Gandhi said, we have taken the revenge for a thousand year of slavery and defeat, she was referring to the past one thousand year of Muslim rule, which they have never forgotten, the humiliation and shame which they carry within themselves, even today, and the two nation theory, which, we have, which she said we have drowned in the Bay of Bengal, because she thought, after the breaking Pakistan, the fact they will be able to break rest of the Pakistan as well and bring Pakistan back into the fold of the greater mother India as they call it. The, the concept of Akhand Bharat, the greater India, is very strongly embedded in the Hindu mythology, Hindu psychology, Hindu thought process which sees creation of Bangladesh, Nepal, Pakistan as aberrations, as historical anomalies which must be corrected. So India as an expansionist ideology, as a Hindu saffron terror driven mythology does not accept regional states. This what's is important this, to understand. Uh, what's this uh, Indian saffron terrorism? We get to hear this a lot of times. So what is this Indian uh, saffron terrorism? See, to, to, 
you can see the correlation here to make you understand Hindu extremism or Hindu Zionism is called saffron terror just like the, the Palestine dispute you the term you hear often is the Jewish Zionist the Jewish Zionist term is used for those radical Jews there's so many good Jews in the world who are against the state of Israel there's so many good Jews there in fact there are more of them who are against the state of Israel Jews but there are Jews who believe in using military force violence brutal slaughter and murder and and violate every law of humanity and even the divine scriptures their Jews those Jews are ruling Israel today and they are called Zionist similarly there are lots of good Hindu good Hindus in the world as well who believe in Ahimsa who believes in peaceful philosophies of life but there are the ruling class the ruling class of India today and for the past so many decades belong to a new ideology of saffron terror or Hindu Zionists who believe in Akhand Bharat the greater India as we said in herself mentioned to the fact that she herself carries the carried the venom within her that they have to take the revenge from Muslims for a thousand year Muslim rule and Hindus have not forgotten that the person just to remind you that the Hindu radical the saffron terrorist Nathuram Godse I think his name was who killed Gandhi Gandhi was killed by a Hindu you, you you probably know that right right and the Hindu who killed Gandhi he was cremated but his ashes were not thrown in Ganges his ashes were not thrown in the sacred river of Hindu they are still being kept why because he has advised he has given a will to his followers that once you capture Pakistan once you destroy Pakistan throw my ashes into river Indus and this is what the Hindu saffron terrorists Hindu Zionists believe they want to reclaim Pakistan they want Pakistan to come back into the fold of the larger greater Akhand Bharat and that that is why they cannot accept Pakistan as a sovereign Islamic state. They cannot. It's against their religion. It's against their mythology. It's against their scriptures. It's against their foreign policy. So, so then, then Zayed Hamid Saab, now that we know that their intentions will never be uh, sincere towards Pakistan and being neighbors towards each other, what should be the strategy of Pakistan to proceed and then keep themselves safe as well? All the factors that we are seeing within Pakistan these days, the terrorism, you know, uh, all the incidents sectarian killings, the ethnic killings that are happening. How do we prevent ourselves? Do we have a RAW and CIA behind all these factors? And then since we are seeing the uh, statements from uh, former Indian Army Chief, General Retired Weekes, saying that there were, uh, as it was an Indian Army involved in creating insurgency in Pakistan. So what should be our strategy now? You see, there is absolutely no doubt into the fact. I mean, Indira Gandhi gave that speech after dismemberment of Pakistan in East Pakistan. Pakistan, which is now Bangladesh. So India has dismembered Pakistan already and their strategy is to dismember the rest of the Pakistan. There is no doubt about this. The wars of 1948, the wars of 65, the war of 71, we dismembered Pakistan, then the Kargil conflict, then so many times eyeball to eyeball confrontation, which almost turned into a nuclear flashpoint, the occupation of Kashmir, the sending of insurgencies in Pakistan, the support to Tahrik Taliban, Baluchistan Liberation Army, the violence in Karachi. These things are ongoing. The very simple fact that Pakistan is being declared as the most dangerous nation in the world today is because of Indian sponsored terrorism. Now, and the only solution that Pakistan Pakistan can have is, Ayyadazam had very categorically defined this point as well, the only way to deter an enemy from destroying the two nation theory, from destroying Pakistan as a state, because Ayyadazam knew this very well that India is a Hindu state, it's not a secular state, it's a Hindu state and Ayyadazam so many statements are on record saying this, warning our nation that be careful of the fact that India will remain a Hindu state and they will not accept Pakistan as a separate nation state and in fact they will try to bring Pakistan back into the fold of the larger India so and he said the only way Pakistan can protect itself is to have a very strong military deterrence and any amount of money that we spend on our national defense in the face of such level of anarchic threat is worthwhile and that's what Qaid Azam actually warned us and advised us that we can live without so, economic development but we must have a strong defense so now the question comes to that do we have a strong defense or not we will we will continue our discussion right after a short break stay with us we'll be right back after a short break 
Welcome back, viewers. We are analyzing the relations between Pakistan and India, and today, at what stage are they standing? How should we proceed from here? Before going on the break, uh, Zaid Hamid mentioned that uh, Qaeda Azam advised us that to prevent Pakistan from all kind of insurgencies, we must have a very strong defense deterrent. Let's see that what are we standing up to now? Are we standing strong enough? And then the recent confessions that are being made by the former Indian Army Chief, General Retired VK Singh, in which he claims in Hindustan Times that Indian Army supported the insurgency in Pakistan. For that purpose, Indian Army contacted uh, secret missions, uh, carried out secret missions, and they contacted Lashkar-e Tayyaba to create this insurgency. Also, he claims that they had a special unit called Technical Support Division, and uh, that conducted operations like Deep Strike Pakistan. And he also said that Indian Army paid to destabilize the Umar Abdullah government. Now, before we continue our discussion, we would like to see what Weekesing Singh has to say and what other statements can we bring from uh, f related to these statements that he mentioned. Let's have a look at that. Why? Why would the army transfer money oh. to a minister? Army transfers money to all the ministers in JNK. Army you transfers to money to the ministers in JNK? Absolutely. Please explain. Because there are various things to be done. Now what the done? Ministers have to do various things. Like what? There are so many things to be done. As part of the stabilizing factor in Jammu and Kashmir, as part of the activities to be organized. Does, does that not amount to interference in the affairs of a civilian government? I don't think so. Why? If, uh, if, uh, if a civilian government is unable to get the people together and if you can assist them mind my words if you can assist them without making them feel that they have failed in their task i think you are only helping a national sansthaon ki integrity ke baare uski copy aapko di gayi hai aapne wo padhi hai mera manna hai ki agar iske upar karwai hoti तो शायद आज जो हम दुर्दशा देख रहे हैं वो नहीं हो और मेरा यह भी मानना है कि अभी भी समय है कि इसके ऊपर कार्रवाई की जाए ताकि ऐसी चीजें दोबारा ना उभरे एक और चीज जो मैं तथ्यों के आधार पर बड़े जोर के साथ समझाना चाहता हूं जब मैंने कहा कि कुछ राजनीतिज्ञों को पैसे दिए गए वो पैसे उनके व्यक्तिगत काम के लिए नहीं थे वो पैसे उनकी जेब के लिए नहीं थे वो पैसे उनके राजनीतिक कार्य के लिए नहीं थे वो पैसे सिर्फ उनके नाम के आगे इसलिए लिखे गए कि शायद उनको बिना उनकी जानकारी के ऐसे फंक्शन में बुलाया गया जो शायद इस यूनिट ने बाकी संस्थाओं के साथ ऑर्गेनाइज किया होगा Yes, as you saw, uh, we K Singh uh, confessing that Indian Army was involved in destabilizing Pakistan, and then he mentioned that Army transfers money to destabilize government in Jammu Kashmir. So uh, now, once there, this is not the first time that their own officials have come out and claimed something that has been done previously. We do have Parliament attacks, we do have Mumbai attacks, we do have some Jyota Express, and after all those attacks, their own officials came up and they claimed that these things were planned by the Indian officials. Why don't our governments make a stern stand and then give them a response in UN or they take this strategy of Indian government creating all this and then claiming it later. You see, in the nuclear age, when Pakistan and India both are nuclear powers, a new doctrine of war has developed between the two nations. Pakistan has been more passive in the last 10 years, particularly ever since Pakistan has joined the American so-called war on terror. The government of Parvez Musharraf, the government of Zardari, and now the government of Nawaz Sharif, they've all been taking very subservient and docile role to the Americans. And the American pressure has always been on Pakistan to have good terms with India. It was Musharraf who actually allowed... At any cost. At any cost. And it was actually Musharraf who allowed the Indians to have a fencing on the line of control. For the last 65 years, line of control was a disputed territory. Pakistan had never allowed Indians 
needs to form a fence line so that Kashmir could be permanently divided because India always wanted the line of control to be turned into a permanent border and Pakistan has always objected to it. But Musharraf actually allowed them to form a fence and now Indians are claiming that that fence is now permanent border. So the Pradari government as well and Nawaz Sharif government as well are under strong American and IMF pressure to have good terms with the Americans. So Pakistan is actually not doing anything inside India. But Indians taking advantage of the fact that the, there's a strategic alliance between the Americans and the Indians, the American presence in Afghanistan has allowed the Indians to be in Afghanistan. And the fact that both nations are nuclear powers and they prefer to avoid a nuclear confrontation. In that scenario, the new doctrine that has been developed by the Indians are called the urban fourth generation war, which means support to insurgencies, support to militant groups, support to terrorist groups, support to the political parties, both inside Pakistan and in, uh, in Kashmir as well, who would be then undermining or sabotaging all peace processes, who will be sabotaging the internal political process of Pakistan all major political parties of Pakistan quite a few of them who are in the government now have strong Indian contacts Awami National Party in Pakistan is known to be very close pro-Indian party NQM is known to be strongly pro-Indian party Nawaz Sharif government which is ruling Pakistan now is, is has completely flattened itself in front of the Indians Zardari government had absolutely no backbone they were following the American policy the principle the Baluchistan Liberation Army the political parties some political parties in Sin they are strongly known to be pro-Indian and have been taking funds and resources as well. Their relationship with India, even religious parties, Yamit Ulma Islam for example, Fadl Rahman is known to be a strongly pro-Indian, very close to India. So this is the unfortunate part. It's not just that the Indian, Indian government or Indian army is supporting the political parties in, in occupied Kashmir. But then you, you mentioned all these also. political parties. You mentioned about all these political parties and their influences. What about our army and uh, what is their influence? Like they claim that Indian army has been uh, creating insurgencies in Pakistan. So what is our army doing to stop it? Our intelligence agencies, see, ISI, IB, MI. See, as we said, as we said for the last 10 years particularly, Pakistan army has been involved in fighting insurgencies at home. We have been bogged down in massive urban wars. Pakistan has given almost 100,000 dead and wounded in the last 5-7 years. And Pakistan army is taking so many casualties every day. There has been... Even if there is a small blast in occupied Kashmir, Indian occupied Kashmir, they blame Pakistan. But they are, in the last 90 days, there are almost 200 terrorist acts and attacks in Pakistan. But Pakistan government does not blame India for it. And this is what Pakistan army is doing, fighting an urban insurgency at home. They do not have time actually. Right now they are overstretched, they are over-resourced, they are giving casualties, they are, I mean their, their resources are stretched and Pakistans have, for the first time in Pakistan's history, we had to move our troops from the Indian border to the Afghan border because now from Afghanistan the insurgency is flowing into Pakistan. This is what Indians have done. They definitely have an upper hand. Pakistan will have to, if Pakistan army continues to go back into its shell, fight an urban war in a reactive manner, we will keep on taking losses. Pakistan will have to get aggressive into Afghanistan. Pakistan will have to get aggressive inside India as Indians are doing it. Every country does this. Whenever you have a threat, you try to preempt this. You support you support insurgencies, you support rebel, rebel and separatist movements. India has done this. India supported insurgencies in East Pakistan. That's why they dismembered Pakistan. And India so, already has 140 separatist and terrorist groups. Pakistan Army, Pakistan Intelligence and Secret Services will have to get aggressive if they want to control the insurgency in Pakistan. So they're not because aggressive enough right now? Not at all. Pakistan, they have to get more aggressive. What is happening? So is, 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 it, is it showing their weakness then, what we are going through right not, now, one after the other? attack. We will not call it weakness, but what has happened in the last six years is that Pakistan army has taken a policy decision that they let the politicians decide. The, the, ever since the democracy has come into this country, Pakistan army has taken a policy decision that they will not interfere into politics and would focus ourselves only on the military matters. As a result, that this new 21st century war is being fought by the army only on the military axis, not on the diplomatic axis, not on political axis, not on media axis, not on judicial axis, because the judiciary is not delivering, not supporting the army in fight against terror. The, the parliament is not supporting the army. They are not making new laws. The government is not hanging the terrorists which army is capturing and the judiciary is releasing them. So in that scenario, the crisis is many folds for the army. On one hand, they are fighting the insurgents. On the other hand, they have no support from the government department, judiciary, parliament and cabinet and the, and the government itself. So, so uh, Zaid 
Sir, tell me this, that when we hear, like we Kissing mentioned, that Indian Army had a special unit, technical support division, to conduct operations like Deep Strike Pakistan, then the question comes that where is our ISI, where is our intelligence agencies? Weren't they supposed to protect us from all these uh, conspiracies you that see? India is making against us? Like uh, the church incident happens, Peshawar church massacre happens, we have the Banu jail incident happens. So where is our ISI, our let intelligence me, agencies? Let me clarify one thing. In 1970, again we'll go back to East Pakistan because that's a, that's a fascinating test case for us to understand the Indian psyche. Pakistan had elections in 1970 and after the election there was some internal turmoil. In March, Indira Gandhi called the Indian Army Chief General Manikshaw and said, I want to invade East Pakistan now. And General Manikshaw responded by saying that Indian military needs 10 months of training. I can attack by November, not in March. So give me some time. So Indian Prime Minister said, Indira Gandhi, same Indira Gandhi which made that victory speech, said, okay, I will take help from Indian intelligence services till that time. So they created, Indian Prime Minister ordered the Indian Secret Service to go into East Pakistan, create the Muktibani rebels, and for nine months, Pakistan army fought the Muktibani rebels till the time Indian army was ready to move in from all sides and they captured East Pakistan. This is what happens. Pa Pakistan, all intelligence and secret services can do anything you tell them to do, but they have to be told by the political governments. For the last 10 years, Pakistan, ISI, and intelligence services have been stopped, choked, have been completely restrained from operating inside India. As that I told you about the about the fencing on the line of Kashmir. Kashmir is a disputed territory. Even if Pakistan crosses the line of control, we are not violating any international law. It's a disputed territory. It's in the resolution is in the UN. Both countries claim it. A line of control has been changing in the last 40, 65 years so many times. So, if, so sending in militants into Kashmir, or if the Kashmiris migrate into Pakistan, or if Pakistan decides to wage a war on the line of control, as India did, India crossed into Siachen, captured a Pakistani glacier in Siachen. Again, that was across the line of control. India did it, and still India is holding lots of Pakistani lands in Pakistani glacier land. So the fact of the matter is, everything can be done. There are six insurgencies in India. There is 140 separatist movements in India. The biggest threat to India is from the Naxalite Maoists, which control almost 40% of Indian Indian Federation. So everything can be done. India can be broken down. India has never been a unified state in its history, except when Muslims were ruling or when the British ruled. Before that, India was always a collection of Rajas and Maharajas, like Counts and Dukes. So if we, if we look at the threats that are to Pakistan in the form of BLA, TTP, and then if CIA and RAW are supporting these elements to create a, a massacre in Pakistan, then how come ISI and all these intelligence agencies play a stern role to prevent all these insurgencies? You see, that's exactly what I said. When you fight an urban war, you need new laws. You need to give more powers to the secret services, to the intelligence services, to the Pakistan army. Because what is happening in Pakistan today is that you are deploying Pakistan army into operations. You are deploying the Pakistan military intelligence services into operations. But when the terrorists are caught, they are handed over to the civilian judicial system. And the civilian judicial system is so weak that it's not able to convict them. It actually releases them. Like because the laws are so weak and laws are weak because the parliament is not making stronger laws. And the government is so weak that even those who get convicted somehow are not given even capital punishment because the government has put a moratorium, a restriction on putting, on, on sentencing the terrorists to death. So this is basically a farcical anarchy in what, the democracy. How do, you, how do you see the new amendment in the anti-terrorism legislation that has been done by the cabinet recently? We will have a whole show on the judicial system as well, but I just want to know a quick analysis see, that one word. when it comes to it's the anti-terrorism legislation. A, it's, a, it's a judicial comedy. Just one word. Why? Because no amount of legislation is going to deter the terrorist if you put a ban on death sentence. What is happening is the army captures the terrorists and they are released and the terrorists know that they will never be sentenced to death because the government has put a, put a restriction on death sentence. So this is a judicial comedy. No matter what amount of terrorists should be terrorized. Terrorists should be punished. They should be hanged, eliminated, even through firing squads or, or, or judicial hangings doesn't matter. But a terrorist who has killed hundreds of people in Pakistan, an insurgent, a rebel, a suicide bomber, has, deserves no mercy. He has no human rights. So then when we come to a point where we want to find out a solution that how can Pakistan be eliminated from all these problems, what do you suggest? How to fight back to BLA, how to fight back to TTP, how to fight back all these elements? Fighting the insurgency is absolutely no problem in Pakistan. I have just told you that 
If the state wants, insurgents stand no chance. But in Pakistan, we see a conflict between the state organs. And this is actually helping the enemies to explore, to exploit this power vacuum, to exploit this coordination between the state organs. The judiciary is not helping, the, the parliament is not helping, the government is not helping, the cabinet is not helping, the media is not helping. In fact, they're all hostile to the army. An army is being forced to fight a 21st century urban war using 1860 British laws. And so why, then the, then the question comes that why is our leadership having been, you know, blindfolded to all this? What will wake them up? What could be done to make them aware of See, the, of the, the war, dangers waiting for us? The war has reached into our homes. Even the senior general level officers are being killed. So many politicians have also been killed. And perhaps the way the state is withdrawing, the way the state is giving space to the terrorists, I will not be surprised if some very senior politician of Pakistan may also be eliminated someday by these terrorists. Every day you find attacks on even the Pakistan Army's general headquarters was attacked, Pakistan Army Air Force air bases were attacked, Pakistani politicians are being attacked, schools, embassies, diplomatic enclaves. Nothing is sacred anymore. Every place is being attacked because the initiative is with the terrorists. Because the state is withdrawing. The state is giving space to the terrorists. Judicial system is not working. So unless and until the state realizes, the government realizes that they have to wake up, make stronger legislation, impose death penalty, give more strength and power to the army and the intelligence services. I'll not be surprised that Pakistani prime minister or president or some governor may also be assassinated by these terrorists who can kill hundreds of people in like in recently in Peshawar you saw in a church attack they killed almost a hundred Christians so nobody is safe Muslims non-Muslims so it's not a question of and 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 Tehreek-e Taliban Pakistan is not claiming the responsibility it doesn't matter whether massacre. they claim or not they are compulsive. now there's a Jandullah group that See, is you know claiming it doesn't matter they are Tehreek-e Taliban are compulsive liar terrorist groups the fact of the matter is no group in Pakistan has suicide bombers except TTP whether they claim it or they don't claim it the fact of the matter is somebody went in to blow themselves but, but, but up but why would not they claim it if they would have done it then they have claimed all the previous uh, massacres it, or incidents that they did like for Why example not like, like for example the fact is the international condemnation was too strong and they are very smart people when they seek when they do something for example also the, when the when the when the blast in Peshawar's Mina Bazaar took place in which over 300 people were killed in Peshawar the public backlash the national backlash was so intense especially when the attack on Malala took place the national backlash was so intense the Taliban actually went on the back foot and denied it and even offered an apology later so 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 do you think that this uh, Peshawar church massacre was kind of giving a message or some kind of pressure to Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif before he does his speech see, basically what is what is we will, happening we will, um, uh, we will continue our discussion after a short break stay with us we'll be right back after a short break Welcome back, we are, we are analyzing the relations between Pakistan and India as usual. We would like to know that what is the core issue, what is the problem, where do we stand today as both the Prime Ministers are in New York for the United Nations General Assembly session. Before we come back to our discussion, we would like to show you that the recent attack in Magbuza Kashmir on an Indian army camp in which an Indian colonel and few soldiers have been killed and how Indian media is propagating that this attack has been conducted by Pakistan army without any proofs, without any evidences. Let's have a look at that and then we will come back to our discussion. और ये लगातार कहा जा रहा है कि वो जब से सीजफायर उल्लंघन हुआ है घुसपैठ की लगातार कोशिशें की जा रही हैं कि क्या भारत का आखिर स्टैंड है हालांकि बहुत ही स्ट्रांग रिएक्शन भारत की तरफ से दिखाई दिया था उस वक्त लेकिन अब क्या क्योंकि अब नवाज शरीफ से इनकी मुलाकात होने वाली है क्या ये मुलाकात संभव हो पाएगी क्योंकि ये नेशनल सिक्योरिटी का मामला है इलेक्शन से पहले ये मुलाकात है लोकसभा इलेक्शन यहां पर है इसका खासा असर पड़ेगा सरकार पर क्या आपको लगता है देखिए भारत पाक की भारत पाक प्रधानमंत्रियों की जो दोनों देशों के प्रधानमंत्रियों की मुलाकात है सभी की निगाहें इस मुलाकात को लेकर टिकी हुई हैं ऐसे में चूंकि चुनाव छह सात महीने बाद हैं देश में होने वाले हैं और सरकार को जवाब देना है खुद प्रधानमंत्री की ओर से आखिर क्या पायल की जाती है जिस तरीके से आतंकवादी घटनाएं लगातार घट रही है और अच्छे रिश्ते पाकिस्तान से नहीं है लेकिन जिस तरीके की पहल की जा रही थी हालांकि भारतीय अधिकारियों की तरफ से जो उत्साह होता है 
है दोनों ही देशों के प्रधानमंत्रियों के बीच वार्ता होती है वो उत्साह नजर नहीं आया है ऑफ द रिकॉर्ड यदि बातचीत करें प्रधानमंत्री के विशेष विमान में बहुत सारे उनके साथ जो अधिकारी चलते हैं उनसे जो चर्चा हुई है उनमें से खास तौर पर ये बात सामने निकल कर आई है कि उत्साह नहीं है लेकिन प्रधानमंत्री ने इस बात की चूंकि पुष्टि की है कि पाकिस्तान हो बांग्लादेश हो नेपाल हो इन सभी देशों के प्रधानमंत्रियों से चर्चा की जाएगी सभी अहम मसलों को इस चर्चा में शामिल किया जाएगा ऐसी स्थिति में जब उनतीस सितंबर को प्रधानमंत्री की मुलाकात नवाज शरीफ से होनी है तो एक सवाल यह निशान खड़ा होता है कि इन घटनाओं के बीच तमाम कोशिशों के बावजूद भी शांति वार्ता को लेकर जब चर्चा की पहल हो रही है और ये घटना घटती है तो क्या इस अगला कदम मनमोहन सिंह का होगा ये कहने ये ये कुछ देर बाद ये नजर आता है ये नजर आता है जो पाकिस्तान में माहौल है या पीओके में जिस तरीके से जो चल रही है तमाम चीजें रणनीति के मुताबिक ये हमला किया गया है पूरी साजिश के साथ ही हमला किया गया ये वार्ता का ये समय नहीं है पाकिस्तान पहले आतंकवाद के खिलाफ ठोस कदम उठाए दिखाए और उसके बाद विचार हो सकता है लेकिन पाकिस्तान तो कुछ नहीं कर रहा है और हम ही जाकर आतंक और शांति वार्ता दोनों साथ साथ नहीं चल सकते कि भारत के प्रधानमंत्री को जाकर उन्हें मिलने की नवाज शरीफ को वो तय कर रहे हैं और उसी के पूर्व संध्या पर इस तरह के हमले होते हैं तो मतलब साफ है कि पाकिस्तान की नीति में और पाकिस्तान की भूमि से हमले होने के मालिका में कोई बदलाव नहीं हुआ है Saab, as you saw the different segments that you put together and you can tell that the uh, Magbuza Kashmir Indian Army camp incident how Indian media is promoting without any evidence without any proof that this is the conspiracy done by Pakistan now tell me this before going on the break we were talking about how uh, uh, Peshawar church massacre happened while prime minister was about to leave for United Nations session then this Magbuza Kashmir incident happens and they talk about both the prime ministers meeting in UN so is there a connection how these incidents are happening is it is it a is it a conspiracy to avoid that meeting prime minister nawaz sharif was going to the christian world and the massacre of christian at that particular moment was actually meant to send a signal to the world to the western world that pakistan is a failing state its democracy is failing pakistan state is facing a collapse and it's a dysfunctional democracy which is not capable to have nuclear weapons see that lots of signals are sent through one terrorist act the very simple fact that the indians are now blaming pakistan for the occupied kashmir attack on an indian army base let me remind you something pakistani prime minister was about to meet the indian prime minister is about to meet the indian prime minister in new york but about 3 weeks ago about a month back indian army chief had advised the indian prime minister not to meet pakistan prime minister and it was unprecedented advice because indian army chiefs normally do not meddle into politics but there he came out openly and advised the indian prime minister not to meet pakistani prime minister but the indian prime minister still decided to go ahead with the meeting and then this attack comes in occupied kashmir and suddenly the pressure is again built on the indian prime minister not to meet pakistani prime minister it's and the, then also the exam, case of ajmal kasab the mumbai attack right he suspect or convict that you showed the the affidavit given by the indian home secretary has completely proven the language of the language tone the words that he was using the were, faith were, that the he phrases that he was using in. were all hindu phrases no muslim could be using this language this phrase this tone so it is absolutely no doubt that indians had been carrying out false flag operations in india blaming them on pakistan to achieve the greater strategic objectives whether it is the formulation of anti terror laws whether to to mobilize their army to, to attack pakistan to achieve certain greater objectives 
this particular attack in Indian occupied Kashmir is also a false flag just like the Mumbai attack, just like the parliament attack, just like so many other attacks where Indian investigative reports have also proven that they were false flag operations. So then Zayat Ahmed, sub, how come uh, so many attacks, they were planned and then they did end up approving that Indians planned it themselves and now all these series of attacks happening again. How long will it take the international world to realize that all this is Indian conspiracy? Why isn't, again, my you same see, question, Pakistan having a stern stand in UN and claiming that India has to stop doing this? You see, in the modern diplomacy, in the model, in, in the international community today, actually there is no justice, there is no law. It's in fact not even the law of the jungle there. Americans got away with mass murder of Iraqis on a false pretext of weapons of mass destruction. Israelis get away with mass murder every day of Palestinians whose land they have occupied for the last 65 years. So basically there is no law in the international community now. Under what law Americans destroying the Middle East, reshaping the Middle East, they have almost killed three to four million Muslims already in the last 10 years and still the world is blaming Muslims for being terrorists. So there is no law going on. What the Indians are doing is they are riding the western wave of their war against Muslims. And if, to put it simply, Indians want to fight Pakistan to the last American. They are trying to ride the American sentiments and emotions to fight Pakistan. And as long as this global environment remains, nobody would listen to a Pakistani voice. But still, the Pakistani government itself is weak. Pakistani government is not taking up those cases in the United Nations or in the international community. We have proof, we have evidence available with us, but that evidence is not being presented to the international media or to the international community. At least and the Pakistani... That's, that's a bigger question, why? Why? And then, again, we see Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif claiming that, you know, he would like to have the same environment as it was in 1999 uh, when uh, there was a peaceful situation between so Adulwid and this is, the, this is the problem of memory. Indira Gandhi and Indian leadership have not forgotten the baggage of 1,000 years. They still carry the baggage and they fear the future that this baggage could actually be transported forward. And India could face a threat from Muslim, Muslim West, from, the, from, from Central Asia, from Afghanistan, from Pakistan. The threat could also come in future. They have not even forgotten the 1,000 year baggage and these Pakistani leadership don't even have a memory of five years to know that what India has been doing into Pakistan. This is the unfortunate reality. Handling the challenges, threat violence, terrorism in Pakistan is not an issue. Finding a government in Pakistan is right now we don't have a government. That's the crisis. You're saying that we don't have a, a government in Pakistan and then if we look at the government making uh, in India that BJP, the biggest opposition over there, have nominated Narendra Modi as a candidate for the Prime Minister. So how do you see the government making over there that's going on before their general elections? See, Narendra Modi is a man who's known globally as a, geno as a, as a genocidal beast. He is the man who burnt humans alive in Gujarat massacre. At least 5,000 Muslims were burnt alive by Narendra Modi. Lots of countries do not give him visa for the crimes that he has committed against humanity. And this is exactly what we have been trying to tell you. The saffron terror has penetrated Indian politics. The saffron terror has penetrated Indian mainstream mom forces. And the saffron terror of India has now the nuclear button in their hands. The world is a most dangerous state, not because of the bombs in the hands of Muslims or in the hands of Pakistan, but because the bomb is now in the hands of the saffron terrorists, the Hindu Zionists who are ruling India now. That's the threat world should be very careful about because if Pakistan and India go to war and we will, if we go to war, it will be instigated by the Indians. Pakistan is five times smaller state than India. We gain nothing by starting the war. They'll start the war. Pakistan will only respond. And now the fanatics, the, the terrorists, the extremists are coming into mainstream Indian politics. Indira Gandhi dismembered Pakistan and Narendra Mundi want to finish what was left over by Indira Gandhi. That is, finish off the rest of the Pakistan. He'll never achieve it, but what he'll you, achieve yeah, is... Yeah, that's what I want to know. Do you think BJP will make the magic number 272 over there in the elections? You see, Narendra Modi always survives on anti-Muslim vote. He, 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 he votes for the larger Hindu community. Muslims are not an important vote for them. He, he survives on Hindu radicalism. He survives on Hindu extremism. He survives on saffron terror. And that's what he's going to do. And if he he comes into power in India, he is going to be a 10 times more radical than what Congress is. If Congress is a terrorist party as well. Indira Gandhi dismembered Pakistan. She, she is the one who started terrorism, orchestrating insurgencies and rebellions inside Pakistan and asked General Manik Shah to attack and dismember East Pakistan. Narendra Modi would do 10 times more. The only way Pakistan can respond is to be so strong that they don't dare to do that. And the insurgencies that 
they're doing inside Pakistan, we have now moral, legal, international military right to do the same with India. So we are not doing it yet, but we must do it. Zaid Ahmed, sir, one more topic I want to touch base. We have just two minutes left. Um, I'm looking at this, uh, these lines here. That says that water wars between the two countries, India and Pakistan. India has planned 155 hydro projects on Pakistan's rivers. What are we doing for this upcoming uh, problem see, the, or, or again, a disaster of water crisis in Pakistan? You see, India is working on multiple axes of war. This is what we call fighting the low-intensity conflict, the urban fourth-generation war, which is fought on diplomatic pain, which is fought on insurgencies, militant group, terrorist group, water wars, media wars diplomatic wars trying to avoid the nuclear holocaust so what the indians are doing now is blocking pakistani water is like waging an insurgency in pakistan more ruthless than the suicide bombings we can survive the suicide bombing but we cannot live without a water and that is something that is definitely going to provoke pakistan into a retaliation and once we retaliate a five times smaller country against indians will resort to the weapon that we have of our choice we will not wait for the balance of power which the conventional balance of power that india has five times more power, power forces than us it will be a nuclear holocaust pakistan can live without the land of kashmir but not without the water thank you very much zaid hamid for joining us uh, we are, as you saw our analysis between the relations of pakistan and india and what we came down as a conclusion is that our leadership and army must stand together and have a stern stand towards these all these insurgencies that are coming from india if we do not stand strong right now then we might be facing another crisis which is water crisis which would be more harmful than these terrorist insurgencies. That's it for tonight. See you next Sunday for more analysis on Middle East, India and Pakistan. Till then, take good care of yourself. Allah Hafiz and good night.